Okay, that should be a recording. All right, so today we're going to talk about universal properties. So presumably you will have seen some universal properties. I mean, you've definitely seen some things that are defined by universal properties before. OK. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, the sort of fundamental um, example. So definition. Um, and initial object. in some category C is X and C. Oh, no, maybe I'll stick to the notation I've used here. Uh, so I'm going to use the empty set notation here is an object in C such that there exists a unique map from that object to x. Um, oh, actually, maybe that's a bit. Let's write this as such that the home set um, from the initial object to any other object is a singleton for all objects in C. So what that says is that there is a single unique map from this object to any other object in the category. Um, similarly, a terminal object uh, in C is an object. So this is for the line above it. Um, which I'm going to annoyingly call star in C. Uh, okay. I guess I'm going to call it tau. Um, such that maps into it, there's a single map into it from each object. And I'm also going to call that star. But these are just singleton sets. OK, so um, an object of this type, of these types, are uh, just defined by this. Like, this is the universal property of an initial object. This is the universal property of a terminal object. Um, <coughs> um, and these two definitions are dual which is to say they're defined by some diagram with arrows. And the definition in the other direction is just you turn around the arrows. So for the initial object, it's that there's a unique such arrow like this for all x. And for the terminal object, you turn around the arrows. So if this was, I'm still putting this here. So having any object here, but now instead the arrow goes this way. And so these two are dual, um, which <coughs> um, one thing to think about is uh, if you have some category C and um, you have an initial object in it, then that object is terminal in C op in the opposite category, because you just turn around all the arrows. Um, OK, so let's talk about some examples quickly. Um, so the category um, uh, initial and terminal. <coughs> so in the category of sets, 
the initial object is the empty set, and the terminal object is the singleton set. So there's a map from the empty set to any other set. It sends nothing to nothing. There's a terminal object which is the which the only map into a singleton set is the map that sends all of the elements to the one element in the singleton set. Um, and one thing to note here is that this isn't unique, right? This is like this could be this set, or it could be this set. Like it's just a singleton set, but it's not actually one single object. So that's why I've put an initial object instead of the initial object. Um, we'll see later that this is unique up to unique isomorphism. I think that's fairly clear in this case. Um, but in general, when things are defined by universal properties, they're not just sort of, you have that all of those um, objects satisfying that universal property are isomorphic, but you actually have something stronger in that there's one isomorphism up to which they fit the universal property. Uh, but we'll see that in a bit. All right, so in the category of topological spaces, we have the same initial and terminal object. <coughs> There's only one topology possible on this, so I'm not going to specify it. In the category of groups, the initial object and the terminal object are the same. Um, I mean, I've written this as one. Yeah, I probably more appropriate in group to write this as one. Um, but all right. So in the category, div n plus, which was the one where it was, you take the positive natural numbers and you put an or, a partial order on them by divisibility. The initial object is 1. 1 divides all other numbers. Um, but it doesn't have a terminal object because um, oh, I don't like DNA. None. No, there we go. It doesn't have a terminal object because there is no number that is divisible that every other number divides. Um, sorry? I think so. That sounds right. All right. Uh, and then there's the category of fields, which is has fields as objects and I guess ring homomorphisms as as um, as morphisms, and it has neither initial nor terminal objects. Right, so that's what I was about to say, is that the reason that it has neither initial nor terminal objects is because there aren't maps between fields of different characteristics. Um, OK, so this was interesting. We had this instance where <coughs> the initial and terminal objects were the same. And that's an important condition on a category. So we say that a category C is pointed if um, it has an object which is both initial and terminal. All right, um, and we call such an object a zero object. Uh, 
And the reason we call it a zero object is because if I have such an object, and I'm going to call it zero in this case, if we have two other objects in the category, we always have a zero map between them. It's the unique map that passes through the zero object. So this is this map will often just be denoted zero, and people will leave out this bit if you are in a category with a zero object. Um, right, so for example, the zero, the, this zero map in the category of groups is the trivial homomorphism. <coughs> All right, let's keep moving on to other universal properties. So, so if we're given two objects, say x and y, in some category, their product Uh, here I want to put in red. If it exists, so all, for all of these universal properties that we're going to describe, none of them have to exist a priori in the general category. None of them have to exist a priori. Um, like here, we had a category that had neither an initial or terminal object. Not all categories have products. Um, it exists is an object which we're going to call somewhat leadingly x cross y um, together. But it doesn't have to be called that, right? I could just call this p instead. Um, or I, could, I could give this whatever name. The important thing is that it's an object in the category Together, together. Oh, I stopped halfway through that word, and now I'm not sure it's right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. With maps. All right, and I really want to focus on this. It's um, specifying a product or specifying. I mean, not in this case, but often when you specify something by universal property, that is an object with a bunch of associated maps. It's not just the object on its own. <coughs> and we're going to, is this still busy? Yeah. Uh, and we call the maps PR1 from x cross y to x, and PR2 from x cross y to y. Um, all right, such that, all right, such that, and now we're going up to here, such that um, given any pair of maps, f from a to x and g from a to y, there exists a unique map which we'll call f comma g from a to x cross y. Um, and this, so there exists, given any pair, there exists a unique map of this form such that the following diagram commutes. F, this is G, this is the second projection, this is the first projection. So there exists a unique F comma G here. Um, so that this commutes. <coughs> All right, so the point here is that this, the, 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 this unique map 
has to be such that this triangle commutes and this triangle commutes. And that's why it's important that the, these maps are part of the definition of what a product is. OK. Um, and yeah, we'll get to that. All right, so then uh, the coproduct is the dual notion. Again, if it exists, is an object. X, and I'm going to write this. Um, OK, so this comes with maps. All right, now we're making the jewel thing. So our definition should flip all of the arrows. So what are we doing? OK, we've got these projections from the product to one of the, um, one of the objects. Instead, we're going to have a map, which I will call in, that goes from x into the coproduct of x and y. And in. Wait, why did I change this? No, I used one here. All right. It doesn't really matter. In 2, which goes from y to the coproduct of x and y. I think it's what I like. All right, Ooh, that's close enough. Um, all right, and then we want this to be such that given a pair, all right, now our pair went from some other object into our things, so we want a pair in the other direction. So we want a map x, uh, f from x to z. And G from so this up again. This up here was for any for any pair. So sort of A was allowed to be any object in the category. Here Z is allowed to be any object in the category. There exists a unique map, which annoyingly I will again call F comma G. All right, and here it went from our object to our product. So now we want to go from our coproduct to our object such that. And now I want to turn the arrows around on this diagram. So I've got z, I've got the coproduct of x and y, I have x, I have y. Well, I need to turn these arrows around, and I've already got um, the relevant maps. So these are going this way now. That's in one, and that's in two. And f is now going this way from here, and g is going this way. And now our unique map is going in the other direction. All right, so that's what a coproduct is. Uh, I went through that in, I think, a fair amount of detail just to show how, how much these are the same definition but in a different direction, in the other direction. All right, so let's see some examples. All right, so the category. <coughs> product. All right, so we had this um, category div n plus. <coughs> and the product in this category, so again, this was the um, post set category where you put a partial order on the positive integers by divisibility. The product is GCD. The coproduct is so greatest common divisor. The coproduct is the lowest common multiple. Um, if I take the 
So this was, again, with the partial order, well, with the total order on R, just given by less than or equal to. Um, the product is the minimum of the two things you're taking the product of, the product of and the coproduct is the maximum of the two things. All right, let's say finite sets. So that's finite sets with morphisms as functions. Um, the coproduct is the standard Cartesian product. Sorry, the product is the standard Cartesian product. The coproduct is disjoint union. And sort of, hence those choices of notation for product and coproduct. <coughs> All right, in set, this is the same. I don't know why I did different things for those. Um, but those are two different categories. This is a subcategory of set. Uh, all right, and then we have group. Um, now, everyone who's done algebra one should know what the sort of standard product on, on <coughs> product of groups is. Um, but for code product, we have the free product. Um, which I'm not going to explain now, but it's, a, it's an interesting thing. And if you're taking algebraic topology next semester, you will see it. Um, sorry? I don't think so. Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, all right. And then there's um, the category of pointed sets, which we spoke about at the end. Um, which was one of these slice categories, but you can just think of it as it's a category where each set has a specified base point and any function. The morphisms are only those functions which take that base point to the base point of the target. All right. So this, again, is the Cartesian product. And base point, comma, base point is the base point. Right, so I might write base point x and base point y is the base point of x cross y. And that's definitely way too small for the recording. Um, and then this, the coproduct here is going to be um, the disjoint union of x and y quotient um, the relation that the base point of x is equivalent to the base point of y. So we're taking the two sets, we're taking their disjoint union, but we're making their base points the same. <coughs> All right. Um, yes? Mm -hmm. Right, so they're not. So they're not defined without. I wouldn't say you have a product unless you have specified those maps. Um, and I am about to talk, prove the um, unique up to unique isomorphism for products. Um, <coughs> and in fact, the arguments about unique up to unique isomorphism for all of these things with universal properties. Um, are exactly the same. Like, I could have done this for terminal initial objects, but the diagram is nicer for products. Um, uh, yes? Yes. Um, probably. Um, yeah, field's probably the case. Um, <coughs> I didn't come in here prepared to think. Um, <laughs> um, okay, is that products? Right. So let's say let's let's be lazy and say the category of one-dimensional real vector spaces. Um, doesn't have products. I 
think that's true, because I think the product there should be a two-dimensional vector space, but I might be wrong. Um, I, there are, there, there are. I'm pretty sure good examples of categories without products. I'm just. <coughs> Right, so I mean, if you think about the category of sets, you can do x cross y or y cross x, and those are both products for x and y. Um, all right, but let's see that it's unique in a meaningful way. So let x and y be objects in C. <coughs> if a product Uh, x cross y exists, it is unique up to unique isomorphism. All right. So. OK, I'm going to let P with um, projections x, P, projection y, P, and Q with projection x, Q, and projection y, Q be products. of x and y. All right, so like I said, I don't have to call this thing x cross y, <coughs> as long as it comes equipped with maps. All right, so um, what I, well, I want to show that there's an isomorphism. Um, so I should start by constructing maps between these things. And I have a way to do that. So let's see, I have P, I have X and Y, and I have projection maps from P to X. Projection X, P, projection Y, P. All right. But I also have the same thing for Q. So I have a projection map. Q to X and a projection map from Q to Y. <coughs> All right, but by the universal property of a product, I therefore have a unique map here, such that these two triangles can meet. Yeah? All right, well, that's one map. Now I want to map from Q to P. Well, conveniently, P comes equipped with a map to y and a map to x. Now, by the universal property of q, there is a unique morphism this way, such that this commutes. And now what you need to see is that this goes to here. <coughs> and by the unique, by the universal property of P, there is a unique such map that goes from P to here, such that these big outer triangles commute. But these maps are the same, and the identity definitely works here. So this composition has to be the identity. And further, we have these convenient maps from Q to Y. And from Q to X. And now we get a unique map here, such that these triangles commute. But again, by the universal property of Q, we have a unique map here, such that these triangles commute. 
well, that has to be there. The identity works, and because it's unique, it has to be the identity. And so this gives us an isomorphism, like each of the, yeah. These two maps are the same, and they're pairs of an isomorphism. Um, <coughs> and so while there might be other isomorphisms between these objects, um, while there might be other isomorphisms between these objects, just as objects in the category, they're unique in that they're the isomorphisms that make these triangles commute. <coughs> All right, this proof is identical for, say, coproducts. You turn around the arrows. It's the same. Like, literally, just turn around the arrows. Uh, for, for, initial, for initial objects, it's even easier. I have say, initial object one that has a unique map to initial object two, which has a unique map to initial object one, well, that has to be the identity. But I also have a unique map to initial object two, and that has to be the identity. Um, and the point is that once you've seen this argument, uh, in particular, once you've seen it with some arrows added, it's sort of next time you see a universal property, you should immediately see how to construct its uniqueness up to unique isomorphism. Yes, but then we have to say what it means for all. What we have to have a definition for universal property, and I'm not giving one today. We don't have the machinery for it yet. Um, for now, I just want examples of universal properties, uh, partially because it's just one of like it's a useful thing to have seen um, regardless of what you end up doing and so um, <coughs> okay all right so let's talk about i'm just i'm just talking about a bunch of universal products um, time is it oh heaps of time great Um, all right, so let's. Suppose we have maps <coughs> F and G, which go from X to Y. Their equalizer. Again, if one exists, is an object E with a map, and I want to stress this again, with a map. H from E to X <coughs> such that um, what is it? Uh, wait. Yes. F of H equals G of H. All right. Um, satisfying the property. So I could say satisfying the universal property. This is where I would say the universal property. Um, so it's this pair, E, and this map, H, um, or this object, E, and this map, H, satisfying the property that given some map, say little a from a to x, with the same property. So uh, f of a equals g of a. Then there exists a unique map 
say k from uh, a to e. <coughs> Um, such that uh, HK equals A. Um, and there's a diagram here. So we started with we started with X oh, that's, that's two. Oh, yeah. we started with X and we had these two maps, which were f and g to y. And now this part of the diagram isn't required to commute, because those can be different maps. Um, in fact, this would be kind of boring if they weren't different maps. Um, and then we have e. It comes with a map h. So the bits in blue are the information of the of the, um, the equalizer. And then for any other A, with a map little a to here, again, so that going this way and this way commutes, and this and this are the same. There's a unique map here. OK, such that this triangle commutes. So that is any such map into x satisfying that they equalize these two morphisms here factors through h. All right. I'll get to an example. But first, I want to do the dual definition and turn around all the arrows. So again, we have maps f and g from x to y. The co-equalizer of f and g is an object is, let's see, I wanted to call it. C uh, with a map J. And now I'm turning around this arrow. So I want to go from Y into C. All right. Um, and C, <coughs> such that JF equals JG. So I've flipped these around. Uh, satisfying uh, given, given some map little z from z. Ah, no. Little z from y into z um, with. Um, I know that Yossi is there. Uh, probably at. Um, oh, we started at 9:30, didn't we? Um, Um, in like, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes? All right. So given such a map satisfying the property that, let's see, ZF equals ZG, then there exists a unique map, L. Uh, so this was going into our. Um, equalizer, so we want to go out of our equalizer to Z uh, such that uh, 
Um, and now I'm too lazy to figure it out. L j equals z. All right. And now let's do the diagram again. We have x, we have y, f, and g. And the information of our co-equalizer is this map and the object. So this is j. And then we have um, another object satisfying the required conditions, z and little z. And that map also factors through j. So there is a unique map L here. All right. Uh, sure, I can cut it later. So we'll see some examples. Well, we'll see really one example of each of these. <coughs> um, but I'll write some more detail up here. All right. So um, we're going to let uh, f from g to h be a group homomorphism. Um, and we'll write uh, z from g to h for the zero map, which is to say the trivial um, homomorphism that I mentioned before, which is the one that factors through the trivial group. So. This just sends everything to everything in G to the identity in H. OK. Their equalizer is the kernel of F. So this isn't all of the information. Of, of an equalizer. I need to tell you what the map is. And it's the inclusion of the kernel of f into h, into g. There it is. All right, so let's let's see that this thing actually is an equalizer for the zero map and some and the group homomorphism. So we'll let phi be a group homomorphism um, uh, and it has to satisfy so such that let's see. We need that um, Z phi equals f phi. What does that mean? That means that um, f, oh, thank you. That means that f phi of a equals z phi of a 
but z of anything is the identity. So, phi of a is an element of the kernel of f. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, which is so I'm going to be a bit abusive with notation and think about this as being in G, right? Because somehow I've I've said what the <coughs> kernel is and you know what the kernel is, but I'm talking about two separate like I'm talking about two separate objects. Like I'm talking about the kernel as being something here, and I'm also thinking about it as something that's in here. Um, all right. Uh, then we let uh, psi be a map from A to the kernel of F, which just sends any element to um, its image under <coughs> the phi map. All right. Uh, this is a group homomorphism as phi is a group homomorphism. Um, now notice that um, doing psi and then the inclusion is the same thing as doing phi because that's how we defined it. Um, OK, so we've shown, we've shown that there is such a map here, right? So from our A to our kernel, we found such a map that this triangle commutes. Now we just have to show that it's unique. Um, and oh, maybe I'll do this on the next board. Suppose. Uh, we have a different I don't know how familiar this type of argument is to people. Suppose we have a different uh, psi prime from A to the kernel of F so that this triangle still commutes. So suppose that um, Suppose that this psi is not unique. <coughs> so I want it to be such that uh, the inclusion of psi prime is the same as phi. Well, then um, the inclusion of psi prime of an element is the inclusion of psi prime of that element. Um, is psi prime of A, which, because we started here, this is also equal to this, which is equal to psi of A, which is equal to the inclusion of psi of A from here. But that's the same thing as psi of A. So these two, psi and psi prime, are the same. So we've shown um, that there exists such a map and that it's unique. Uh, OK, so that's sort of everything to show that the kernel of f is the equalizer of these two things. The co-equalizer of um, <coughs> f and z now I'm probably actually getting out of the recording. The co-equalizer of f and z is the co-kernel of f, unsurprisingly, um, which is h mod the image of f. All right. Uh, I think we should take a break here. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs>
Right, so I'll use the same colors that I used. OK, so for this example that we just did, we had <coughs> G and H, and we had this map F, and we had the zero map here. And then we had the co-kernel, uh, sorry, the kernel of F was our, um, along with inclusion, was our equalizer. And then I was saying that given some, some group homomorphism from A to G, such that uh, going from here to here made these two equal. So one thing I didn't actually say and left implicit was that um, if when you include the kernel, applying f to the kernel of f gets you the identity. And so that's so that satisfies the this condition here. All right. And so a was this was uh, phi. And this was psi. And I guess for completeness, this was iota. All right. All right. Um, yeah, we'll have a break here. <laughs>